Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Our topic for today is estrogen dominance with Magdalena was lucky. <laughs> um, estrogen dominance, which is typically described as having too much estrogen in relationship to progesterone, can lead to many symptoms, including mood swings, anxiety, decreased sex drive, worsening PMS symptoms, heavy periods, irregular periods, infertility, bloating, weight gain hair loss, insomnia, brain fog, hot flashes, and night sweats. It can also lead to various health conditions, including ovarian cysts, fibroids, endometriosis, and fibrocystic breasts, among others. Magdalena Wislocki is the founder of Hormones Balance, a thriving online community dedicated to helping women balance hormones naturally. Magdalena is a nutrition coach, certified herbalist, a best-selling author, speaker, and educator. She has a long history of hormonal challenges. Her health crisis was a direct result of a highly stressful life in advertising, starting from Graves and Hashimoto's disease, autoimmune conditions causing thyroid failure, to total burnout and estrogen dominance. Today, she is in full remission and lives a symptom-free life and teaches women how to find their hormonal balance with her books and programs. Magdalena, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me and for spreading the word about estrogen dominance. Absolutely. So um, it, ha can you tell us about your personal health journey and how you ended up having both uh, hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism at the same time, along with estrogen dominance? <laughs> Yeah, you know, so I think the pivotal moment for me was in 2008 when I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease and I was living in Shanghai in China at that point. And, you know, we, we didn't have as many resources as we do now. Uh, you know, you, today you Google Hashimoto's and you have so many websites coming out, you don't know where to get started. Back in the day, there was absolutely nothing. So they kind of put me on a journey of trying to figure out why am I having an autoimmune disease and what's going on. I suspect I, was, I did have Graves' disease be, seven years before that. Um, and so that wasn't really diagnosed as such, but what, it was what were, this, what were the symptoms that uh, made you suspect that? Hyper, of hyperthyroidism? Yeah. Yeah, I was actually diagnosed properly with hyperthyroidism and put on <clears throat> uh, thyroid blockers. And the symptoms were waking up in the middle of the night with an anxiety attack, your heart pounding so much so you can see your chest bouncing off your chest, you know, or your shirt actually bouncing off your chest, <clears throat> sweaty palms a lot of the time, um, losing it with, uh, with the people you love the most or going to a restaurant with a, you know, with a server uh, screwed up your order and you yell at the person uh, and you think like, that's not really me. Uh, so, you know, and then um, beginning to have a lot of hair loss um, at that point with, even though it was, people think it's hypothyroidism or low thyroid that causes hair loss doesn't have to be, you can also lose a lot of hair with hyperthyroidism. But like, you know, with a lot of allopathic medicine, I wasn't um, treated for, f from the root cause perspective, I was just put on a thyroid blocker and six months later declared uh, cured. And of course it all came back with a vengeance <laughs> a few years later, seven years later when I was living in Shanghai. And I was really lucky to be diagnosed really quickly. I did tell my doctor that I have a history of thyroid problems. Uh, she happened to measure my antibodies and that's where, you know, things kind of, uh, proof to, you know, proof was in a pudding, if you will, right. With, with those antibodies. But <clears throat> I think more importantly, you know, it's the, um, it, it's, it, we always talk about our stories from the time, the symptom, the onset of the symptom, right. Or from the time of diagnosis. But, you know, when I think about it, um, it really starts much earlier in your life. Right. And so, not being a breastfed child, I, you know, I was, I ended up in the hospital in the first month already with pneumonia and a whole, a broad range of antibiotics, um, grew up with a very narcissistic and, you know, and, and a nervous mother, right? So that could be a contributing factor, 
had a lot of food sensitivities right from the beginning. I remember being covered with eczema and my mom was, was, you know, proact was, um, I think she had enough foresight to realize that eggs were causing my issues, but like with a lot of food sensitivities, then it turned into cystic acne. So in my twenties until about, I was 28, 29, I was covered in cystic acne, not just the face, but also my, my chest, my back. I used to have them like behind my ears on my butt even. Wow. And, you know, and, and when you were in your twenties, like you said, your prime time of dating and, and, and um, having romantic relationships, it really takes a toll on your self-confidence. Sure. And the pivotal moment was when, when my girlfriend was getting married and she designed these beautiful dresses for us with full open, fully open everywhere. And I'm like, I can't wear this. <laughs> and she's like, you just put makeup on. I'm like, I can't cover these volcanoes on my back. It's going to show. And that's when, you know, I started searching. And mind you, you know, 25 years ago, this was like, this was 20 years ago. This was kind of revolutionary. And I remember this article popped out and said, gluten causes acne. I was like, wow. So this is really where my journey started. And as I eliminated gluten, it turned out not only <clears throat> did my um, acne started clearing out, but my headaches were gone. My bloating was gone. And then, then I discovered that I had a lot of other food sensitivities, including dairy and eggs were my problem, right? So that kind of put me on that path. But, you know, I'm pretty sure it all started much earlier. You know, I have these photographs. I grew up in a tropical country called Malaysia. And I, and I just found the other day photos of, um, of being in a schoolyard. And, and, and I'm wearing this really, this, this kind of like a sweater-like top, like a sweat top, you know, sweat, sweatshirt, but it's thick. And I'm thinking, what am I doing with the sweatshirt in a tropical country right after exercising? But I was cold all the time. That's already telling you, like, it was a low thyroid. It was just you know, brewing right from the beginning. So a lot of things. And then, you know, the estrogen dominance part, which we are here to talk about, I've always had swollen limbs where I couldn't take off my rings. I'll go on a flight. I couldn't put my shoes back on, you know, because my, my limbs were so swollen. My PMSs were so terrible that I had to take one or two days off from school or later work and be in a fetal position with multiple painkillers to just get me through the day. Wow. Um, and, you know, and always lumpy breasts, um, a, lot of, um, a lot of issues with thyroid nodules, which is also another sign, a symptom of estrogen dominance. And so interestingly, on both sides of my family, I have aunts who passed away from estrogenic cancers, right? And so when I had my genetics done and, you know, went to see my functional doctor here in Boulder, Colorado, where I live, I printed out a whole deck of stack of, uh, of, my, of my results in, and she's flipping through it as we chat. And she says, have you had breast cancer? I said, no, why would you say that? And she said, well, you know, patients with your kind of genetics would have had breast cancer by now. And I was 45 at that point. So this was a few years ago. And so, <clears throat> so you know, so genetically, like, a perfect candidate for, for estrogenic cancer. As you mentioned in your introduction, uh, breast cancer, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, but also uh, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, thyroid cancer, and lung cancer in non-smokers are most of the time is uh, fueled by estrogen or the excess estrogen or the dirty estrogen. Interesting. I just was reading an article in the news about the increase in, um, in, in, in non-smokers getting lung cancer. Yeah. And people go like, I wasn't, I was, I never smoked. Right. right. And in men, mind you, you know, uh, I know probably your audience is majority women, but I will say, you know, almost every woman has some kind of a male partner or brother or father. And let me say prostate in men, both prostate cancer and prostate problems, the inflammation of the prostate, as well as men boobs and men boob cancer, are all estrogenic too. Um, so, you know, a lot of times when, <clears throat> when, when women, uh, you know, embark on this diet that I advocate, which is nothing crazy. I mean, it's just a way to metabolize your estrogen, support your body through that. Um, and they asked me, can my husband eat this? And I'm like, actually, it's going to probably help his boobs too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so no, that's it's, the it's story, you know. And he said we're awash in toxic estrogens in this society. And we've talked about that quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's just, you know, just to kind of wrap up my part of the story is that I think that in some ways I dodged the bullet with estrogen dominance and not going the path of, of having a developing estrogenic cancer. And I hope not to, uh, but I think it's because of the work that I do and it's just the amount of effort that I put in. 
Uh, the genetic testing also created a lot of forgiveness and kindness to myself, just to understand that I'm much more prone to developing, you know, these symptoms versus somebody who doesn't have these genetic um, SNPs. So let's always remember genes are not uh, your destination. It's, um, it's just, you're just inheriting a loaded gun, but something right. needs to pull the trigger, right? So, right. and yeah. there's a lot of things we can do to prevent that trigger being pulled. Yeah, I've certainly heard that analogy quite a bit. What is what is the mechanism mechanistic connection between estrogen issues and thyroid? Yeah, so that's really interesting um, that a lot of um, let, let's just just say first of all, most of the time when a woman experiences one hormonal imbalance, such as for example a low thyroid issue, she also would experience or most likely experiences other hormonal imbalances. So it's hardly ever is just one, right? So you know, it's it's good to think of. Um, our whole endocrine system as this very beautiful orchestra that plays really nicely. And if you've been to, you know, a high school concert where the guy with the trumpet screws up at the back, right? Everything, everything, everybody is just like a domino effect. Right. Everybody yeah. you know, kind of gets completely dysregulated, right? And so with hormones, it's a little bit like that. But specifically, since you're talking about thyroid and estrogen dominance, it's really interesting how many women who have Hashimoto's or low thyroid function also happen to have estrogen dominance, right? With also coupling out the symptoms that you talked about earlier. And the way, <clears throat> the mechanism that, that, um, that happens is that, uh, is the biggest thing is that when you have excess estrogen that you re referenced um, earlier, what happens is your thyroid binding globulin is also gets higher. So estrogen bumps up your thyroid binding globulin. And as the name implies, it's a form of a protein, as the name implies, binding globulin, thyroid binding. So <clears throat> when you have too much of that protein, it basically whatever thyroid hormone your thyroid produces, that protein binds up that thyroid, making it unavailable for your body to utilize effectively. And this includes even women who are on synthetic thi uh, thyroid, you know, not, it's not really medications, it's thyroid hormone replacement, right? Like Synthroid as, a, as an right. example. Yes. Um, and so it's a lot of times, you know, when you go and see your endocrinologist and and you say, you know, doc, like my, the, the, the synthroid isn't working anymore, right? And what do they do? Just increase your dose. And a lot of times that dose increase doesn't really do anything. A lot of times actually kind of flips them the other way when they become hyperthyroid, but they're still tired and they're still losing hair, right? They're still putting on weight and all these other, you, they still have depression, anxiety, all this typical um, low thyroid function. That's because estrogen could be the cause of binding. So, so you got to look at the thyroid binding globulin and you need to look at free T3. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> absolutely. So free T3 is your working horse, right? And, and that's where you're going to have the active be, form of thyroid. That's the active hormone. I mean, that's what be, gives you beautiful hair, beautiful skin. And the free know, one is the one that's not bound up by the globulins. Correct. Okay. So, um, you break down estrogen dominance into like three types or categories. And yeah. um, I mentioned one of them, which is this estrogen progesterone ratio. Maybe you can talk about these three categories and, and explain them for us. Yeah. So <clears throat> let me start off with, you know, cause it can get a little bit complex. I'm just going to try to make it really simple uh, for folks to understand. Uh, I, I, let's talk about maybe I'll mention all three, but I think the first two are really good to remember. So the first one, as you said, is excess estrogen to progesterone. Now, one thing I would like to, uh, for our listeners to just to realize that we, we are not here to demonize estrogen in any way, okay? As women, we need estrogen to function properly. If you're still in your uh, pre, you know, pre-menopausal, uh, you're still cycling, you wouldn't cycle without estrogen. You wouldn't get pregnant without it, right? You wouldn't, we wouldn't sleep, we wouldn't have healthy bones, um, good cognitive function, right? Um, you know, beautiful skin. It's, it's like we need it in order to function, right? Yes. Um, so let's not demonize it. The problem is that it's, it's in, the, in a detail, right? So it's very nuanced in some way. And so the nuance here is that, like you said, is the estrogen, and specifically the estrogen we are looking at is, is called estradiol. It's, um, it's the most aggressive form of estrogen and you need so, it. So let me, let me just clarify for some who don't know, our bodies, uh, men and women, contain three different forms of estrogen and you have e1 which is est estrone, estrone. Mm -hmm. and you have e2 which is estradiol and e3 which is estriol and now yeah. you're specifically talking about the e2 estradiol that's right and you know like for example <clears throat> um 
the, the, the part of the reason why estradiol has become a real problem is because it's not only that it, your, your body is producing it on its own, but you're also coupling it up with, for example, if you are using conventional skincare products, right, that are full of parabens, uh, phthalates, all these nice smelling things, all these there, all these various chemicals, many of them are estrogenic. I, I just went to the bathroom and they had one of these um, air fresheners, which is filled with phthalates. And Please, if you have that in your house, throw it away right away. <clears throat> I, I assume that it's your landlord who provides that. Yeah, of course. Your- Actually, I couldn't tell what smelled worse, that or the <laughs> pesticides that they just sprayed to kill bugs. You know, it was just the whole bathroom was awash in toxic chemicals. So that's a that's um and that's, that's know, from, with somebody who's trying to do everything right, and there's all these things you can't control. Right. Um. I mean, what you can't control is just don't use it at home. Don't use it in your car. Of right. You not. get into of course not. Uber, Uber or Lyft. Ask the guy to take it off. I always tell them <laughs> I'm allergic and I get a headache from these smells, and I'm like, I'm so sorry. You have to take this down. It makes me sick. Um. But you know, so we are invaded by estradiol externally as well, and so in the the body doesn't really recognize the difference between those two, and so. That's why we are so, many women are so excessive in that form of estrogen and progesterone. Um, and, so, and so effectively there is not enough progesterone to oppose it. Think of estradiol and progesterone, like two dancing partners, you know, like you've ever seen a dancing competition. If the woman is overly um, beautiful and exuberant and the guy is sim- timid and sort of lacks presence, they don't look good as a couple, right? They'll never win an award. Um, so we're looking for a balance here. And, you know, a lot of women ask us um, when they do a quiz on my side, they, they ask us, they say, you know, your quiz sucks. Like you people don't, you, you have all these errors on your website because, because I've got, I'm in menopause and your quiz tells me I'm low estrogen, which is correct. But you're also telling me, according to your, to your quiz, I'm also estrogen dominant. How is that possible? And so that's a really, and you know, it's a plausible comment, um, although it can be hurtful to hear sometimes. Um, and, and we do explain in the results, but you know, most people don't read them in full, is that you can, you can have both estrogen and progesterone dropping, but the percentage of how much of estrogen to progesterone you have can be, can be unbeneficiary, right? And the problem is that progesterone drops a lot quicker, especially for women after 45, as compared to estrogen. So this is the reason why, if you think about it, this is the reason why, you know, who develops breast cancer? The biggest demographic are women from 55 to 75, right? These women are very low on estrogen, but guess what? They are even low on progesterone. And this is where the imbalance can play, play a role. Um, um, second- hang on one second. Um, sure. I'll get you right back on track, but I'm, I'm, I want to take us down a, 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 a detour for a second. Um, I know that you mostly treat women, but when it comes to men, do you ever uh, consider adding progesterone to, for a man? Because, you know, I, I treat um, a number of men as well as women. And I very frequently see the progesterone levels extremely low. Yeah. So I don't treat men and I'm not in private practice anymore, but whenever I attend conferences where there are practitioners who do, uh, recommend and there are case studies presented. Yes, I have seen multiple times, same as you, practitioners prescribing very small doses of progesterone to men um, that actually helps them balance estrogen dominance, which we said when men can also experience. Right. Okay, good. So let's go back to the three categories of estrogen dominance. Yeah. So the second kind of estrogen dominance is, you know, what I call an ugly breakup. And the ugly breakup basically means is that your estrogens get broken down to metabolites. And guess what? The most important organ that this happens at is your liver. The liver breaks down. You know, a lot of people know it's like, oh, it's alcohol. Some people know about coffee, but it's actually a lot more. It breaks down uh, a lot more, including hormones. And your thyroid, you mentioned thyroid at the beginning. Thyroid also, like your synthroid also gets converted from T4 to T3. The liver is important. So the liver in in the context of estrogen is so fascinating that it breaks it down to these metabolites and these, and, you know, just for simplicity, I call them clean or dirty estrogens. Some of those dirty estrogens are those metabolites that are causing the problem. So as you can see, um, that kind of goes back to the first type of estrogen. You can be low on estrogen, but even in spite of being low, you're still breaking down those estrogens in an unfavorable way. 
And I suspect part of the reason is because as we get older, our liver gets more and more taxed. And if we don't do proper maintenance on on a regular basis and don't do foods and supplements that really help us gently detox on a regular basis, you know, then, then we are not as effectively um, breaking down those estrogens. What makes it even worse is women and constipation. You know, um, I looked around your website and I, I suspect you do work with a lot of women with hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's, right? Yeah. Constipation is one of the biggest issues women experience due to a low thyroid problem. Yeah. And this is where, again, the, thyroid, the estrogen comes in because you're not pooping out your estrogens on a regular basis. You literally, those metabolites, you know, those metabolites I'm talking about are getting pooped out. And when they don't, they re-enter your bloodstream causing... Right making estrogen dominance worse. So that's the, that's um, the, so I just wanted to ask you, um, I, I know in one of your articles uh, in your book, you mentioned um, the uh, two to 16 hydroxyestrone ratio. Yeah. And um, there's some controversy now over whether that really holds up or not. Um, I, there've been some review articles saying, well, it does, it's not really a good predictor for breast cancer. What do you think we are in terms of understanding those estrogen metabolism pathways? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And there is um, the 2 to 16 is kind of like a little bit of the old school of doing it right. through blood testing. Yeah. Um, you have a lot more accurate testing these days. And one of my favorites um, is definitely Dutch. Um, yes. So uh, do, do you use that in your practice? Yes, I do. The yeah. dry urine testing, yep. Right. So, you know, it's a wonderful test. And then you're looking at not just the two, two and 16, but the two, four and the 16. And, you know, I mean, the biggest functional medicine practitioners in our industry use that. Um, I certainly have seen women correlating their symptoms with their results, with the diagnosis they got and find it very accurate, far more accurate than blood uh, yeah. testing, which is completely useless for steroid hormones such as these. Um, so, it, I mean, it, it can be helpful for getting, um, levels, but it doesn't tell you about metabolism at all. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, you know, it's, um, I mean, I still find it very, um, very effective. And I think like any good practitioner, you always want to overlay the results, um, of lab testing like that with the symptoms and of the health course. history yeah. and the family history of a person, right? If your mom has had a history of fibroids and you are have suddenly having really heavy periods and sex is really painful, right? Very likely mm, might be a fibroid, right? Uh, you don't want to get it tested, you know, and, and you get it tested, you sh let's just say that your results don't show, let's just for the sake of argument, show that you are not really estrogenic as such, right? You don't have estrogen dominance. But your symptoms are screaming that you are, right? right? I mean, are you not going to do something about it? Right. And, you know, the, the other interesting thing about testing I find is that every woman needs a different range, right? In order to feel really good. My levels of progesterone might be needing to be on a much higher side for me to feel good as compared to someone else, but that range tends to be very broad. Like what so, range in particular for yourself do you find to be effective? Well, I mean, it depends what you're using for, uh, for measurement, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't remember the ranges right now. And I typically for progesterone, I wouldn't use Dutch. I will use saliva testing. Uh, for, you know, because yeah, Dutch only predicts progesterone. It's a, it's a prediction, not an actual number. So um, I used the saliva and, you know, if I remember correctly, it was like 600 to 1200 um, was the range. And it's a broad range. If, the, if you think about it, 400 to 1200, that's three times more, right? Well, they did um, the same thing with testosterone. You know, they say the right. range is 150 to 900, which is ridiculous. Right, exactly. And, but, you know, like, if I'm, if I'm bleeding in the middle of my cycle, right, that's like a classical progesterone, you know, low progesterone symptom. If I'm suddenly right. waking up in the middle of the night, I can't go back to sleep when I used to be a really good sleeper before, you know, like, you, you know then you're going to like, yeah, I, it looks like I might need more progesterone supporting nutrients or do by identical progesterone. Um, and just because it shows me that I'm okay on a lab test, you know, that's a little um, incomplete view, if you will. Yeah. Okay, and then let's go over the third form. The third form is, you know, there's um, there's three different types of est estrogens, as you as you alluded, um, E1, E2, E3, so estrogen, estradiol, and estriol, and every one of them has a little different function. And so, um, estradiol, like I mentioned, is the most aggressive one, and there is a quotient that's used for a divide for looking at the number and you know and, and determining like the relationship of those three. Uh, that's typically done through saliva. So I don't typically talk too much about this kind of 
um, estrogen dominance because I have found that if you do Dutch and you combine it with, you know, with, uh, with your symptoms, it's, um, it's very telling. And I think those first two that I mentioned, the estrogen to progesterone ratio and then metabolize the clean and dirty estrogens, I think that paints a pretty good picture of then what do you need to do in order to help yourself. Okay, sounds good. So um, let's talk about some of the approaches for each one of these. So why don't, why don't we start with the, um, the dirty estrogen, the estrogen metabolism? What, what types of strategies can we use to promote healthy estrogen metabolism? Yeah, so, you know, I mentioned liver, right? And, you know, as a, as a, as a nutrition person, I'm a chef also and, and an herbalist, right? Obviously, I love to support the liver in the first place through a lot of nutritional changes. You know, one thing I will say that, um, especially I find that it's very true in America, <clears throat> and as you know, as you can probably hear, I'm not American. <laughs> uh, one of the interesting things that I found when I moved here is like how people go very intensely into something, like doing, for example, a very severe deep detox, right? And, um, you know, and some of them are great and some of them are terrible uh, because of just the amount of products that are put in there or uh, how much sugar is in them. Um, and then they come out of the detox and I kind of go back to the old way of doing things, right? Because they deserve it. And, and I find that kind of, it's like, you know, it's like as if you were deciding to do a cleanup of your house on your unboxing day. And, uh, and maybe on spring day again, on the first day of spring. And otherwise you never clean your house. You know, it's, it's, I think that's the best analogy I can give. So there's a lot of things you can do on a daily basis to really support your liver. And, you know, one of the big things is incorporating better uh, foods into your diet. So things like turnips, radishes, um, throw away the lettuce that you're making a salad with, switch to something like arugula or baby kale. They have a lot of bitter qualities. Every time you eat something bitter, what happens? You produce a lot of saliva. Well, guess what? That creates a big cascade of enzymatic production in the body. Not only are you going to extract a lot more nutrients from your food, but the liver loves bitters. The liver gets stimulated. All those detoxification pathways that are responsible for evacuating estrogen, so like the sulfation pathway, the glucuronation pathway, right? methylation pathway, all those pathways work really hard and they love bitters in order to, you know, so you can stimulate that. Another and, one that I also stimulate bile production and a lot of these toxins are put into the bile and that's how they're excreted. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Absolutely. And you know, one of the, one of, uh, I did something a few months ago where I posted on our uh, Facebook page saying who here had a gallbladder removed and did you notice any correlation with symptoms of estrogen dominance later on? And it was a very emotional post. Um, a lot of women came on and said, you know, now that you say it, I realized that ever since I had my gallbladder removed, my estrogen dominant symptoms, you know, whatever that might be, suddenly I suddenly developing fibroids, my lumps, my breasts are so uh, lumpy. A few women came on and said that they were convinced that breast cancer, you know, it's, I mean, I, I've never found a study. I did search when I was working for, on my book to find a correlation between gallbladder removal and breast cancer. I haven't found that, um, but it's, I think it's very plausible. And to your point about gallbladder stores bile, the bile also binds up those dirty estrogens we talked about. So, you know, it's, um, it, it's tragic because doctors don't tell you the consequences of removing a gallbladder. Um, and, you know, and, and they are, and hormones could be, uh, could be one of them. So back to supporting the liver and, you know, and there's a lot of things also you can, um, so yeah, so bitters also stimulate your um, bile production which is awesome and, st and release of bile. Um, so that's a really wonderful and, thing and to you do. Can take herbal bitters in a uh, concentrated form, like in a supplement. Absolutely. Uh, not everybody loves those, but they are super beneficial. And, you know, they've been around for centuries. Like if you think about it, like if you go to um, France or if you go to, you know, you have pastis, right? Which is a very bitter uh, drink, um, any seed kind of um, it's derived from any seed. Um, it's actually you know, common in restaurants here um, a number of years ago to kind of have them at the front. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Okay. There you go. <laughs> you know, you go to North Italy, you have Campari, right? You go to, you know, Denmark, you have, I grew up in Denmark too. So it's got like, they have this digestive called gamel dansk, old Danish it's called, oh, right? Okay. And you have that before or after a meal. And so it's there for a reason. And, and it's not to get, you know, to get drunk, uh, or high, it is just to get those bitters in and they just happen to be extracted best in alcohol. So that's why a lot of times it's in alcoholic form. 
Um, you know, another great way of really moving your liver um, is flaxseed. And I, wanna, I thought I mentioned that as well, because I think it's an interesting food because it's naturally high in estrogens. So this is another source of a lot of controversy in our community, especially people who first join. We get this email saying, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. You are suggesting <laughs> flaxseed is estrogenic. I'm already very estrogenic. Why would I do that? Right. And so I think, again, it's a plausible question. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, I just uh, revert back to what I was saying earlier is that how you break down those estrogens is the issue. And here's the beautiful about flexi is just a, you know, I think and that's the magic of food. And I know you believe in nutrition and food as well and the biochemistry mm. of it. Right. And so one of the beautiful things about flexi is that, yes, it is a phytoestrogen. So actually, if you're low on estrogen, like you're having severe hot flashes, flexi can actually really help you. Um, but at the same time, guess what? the lignans, which is in the fiber of the, uh, of the flaxseed, they block those receptors from those dirty estrogens and coming through. So again, so it's, 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 like, it's like a dirty estrogen blocker. How amazing is that, right? Yeah, well, actually, you know, it's common for these phytoestrogens. This has been a debate, you know, in, in years we've been having now in the functional medicine community. Uh, and and uh, the uh, food people often talk about is soy. Um, which is right. high in these phytoestrogens. And do these phytoestrogens um, increase your risk of breast cancer? Are they, in a sense, estrogenic? And it, it's kind of similar to when you were talking about the estriol, estradiol. So I, I think at least my understanding so far of the literature is that these phytoestrogens, for the most part, are weaker estrogens. So they glom onto these estrogen receptor sites and they can potentially block the toxic estrogens like the estradiol or the um, toxic estrogens from pesticides, et cetera. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and you're right about soy, you have research showing both sides. Um, again, it's very nuanced. I, one of the things that studies um, do not show, do not state, and I've contacted a couple of them and I never heard back, is that what kind of soy were they using? You know, I think that's a very big difference if you're using organic soy versus non-organic GMO kind of soy um, on testing someone or giving them that over a prolonged period of time. So yes. that is never disclosed in any of the studies. I think it's a lot more nuanced. Um, I tend to stay away from soy just because of the variety of, of having both kind of results and all my meal plans and just generally diet is, is uh, free of soy for that reason. Uh, but I, I one think thing another thing has to do with if you grow up eating soy as a regular part of your diet. And if it's kind of part of the natural area where you live, it's part of the natural diet there because there's something to, you know, eating in accordance with sort of where you're from. And uh, I think the body handles it a lot differently than say a woman, uh, maybe an American woman who's never eaten soy. And all of a sudden at age 50, she starts, you know, pounding down all the soy milk and, uh, her body's really not used to dealing with it. Yeah, I think that's a very plausible argument. And, you know, and a lot of people argue that that's on your, based on your genetics, we should be eating. Um, I, yeah, I think it's a very interesting point. Um, and to build on top of what you're saying, you know, it's also most of the soy products in the United States are highly processed, right? And so tofu is highly processed. Um, soy milk is highly processed. And so it's not as natural as what you find, for example, in living in China or uh, Japan, mind you, you know, when they make, for example, soy tofu in, in China, they sell it from a big pot and it's hot and you've got to eat it within a couple of hours because then it goes bad. So it gives you an idea like how much preservatives they need to put in in order to preserve that soy, that tofu, right? Um, going back to flexit, I just want to say one more thing yeah, sorry. that is, uh, that's, you know, because that's one of my favorite foods. And to add, and, and the, one of the also amazing things is that it's, it's full of fiber. So you both have the soluble and insoluble fiber in, in flexi. So insoluble fiber is superb for really helping your gut, but also by the insoluble fiber, it's like that there's a roughage, if you will. It's like a broom that sweeps through your colon. And it really helps a lot with constipation. And it specifically has an affinity towards removing estrogens from the colon. So it's just a really wonderful, um, you know, food to, to add on when you're supporting your liver. On top and of all and the so uh, where do you get the uh, flax seeds and, and how much per day for the average woman? Yeah, so don't buy flax meal because that stuff is already pre-ground and it gets oxidized really quickly. If you notice, uh, for example, um, 
in the supermarkets, flaxseed oil is always sold in a fridge. That's because it gets oxidized really quickly in dark bottles. Um, I'm not advocating oil. The, um, the lignans are found in the fiber, so you've got to have the actual flax seed. So buy it in full seed, uh, whether it's yellow or brown, it doesn't really matter. And, um, and then pre-grind, so grind it yourself at home. Just use your, not a coffee grinder, but like a dedicated coffee grinder so it doesn't smell of coffee. And, um, and just grind it up for like a few days and keep it in a fridge in an airtight container. Um, two tablespoons a day is what um, seems to produce really great results for women. Great. So can you talk about some of the supplements like DIM and, and calcium deglucurate that promote detoxification of estrogens? Absolutely. So <clears throat> um, one, um, I will mention, let me lead to this in, a, in, in but just by saying one thing that one of the superfoods for estrogen dominance, and there's actually studies that were done using broccoli sprouts uh, for women with breast cancer, for example, and the incredible work that sulforaphane does. Sulforaphane is super high in broccoli sprouts. It's also high in all the cruciferous vegetables. So, you know, all your brassica family, right? So the cabbage family. So cabbages, kale, collard greens, um, all, all part of that. However, you have, it depends on the variety, but it's between a 200 to it's, it's between 20 to 100 times more sulforaphane is found in broccoli sprouts than in actual broccoli head. Um, and the and problem, so Tim also comes from those cruciferous vegetables too. It absolutely does. Yes. And so if you are incorporating, that's why I said earlier, throw away the zucchini and the lettuce, right. And bring in, you know, those cruc cruciferous cause they really can help you. And this is why I'm talking about that long-term everyday detox that you do instead of those severe detoxes that people do. And then they go back to, you know, eating trash. Um, so yeah, so, you know, the, so the interesting thing was, we were working with our formulator on uh, producing sulforaphane because of its efficacy in helping with estrogen dominance. And I'll explain in a second, where does it fit into a picture with DIM? Because it does have a very different role than DIM does. And so what happened was we, we realized, and we came across this study, and then we realized that broccoli sprouts um, can have sulforaphane from like negligible to all the way being super high. So it was very disappointing to see because, you know, I would just love to get all my sulforaphane from broccoli sprouts instead of having to rely on a supplement. But the thing was that whether you bought it from Trader Joe or Whole Foods or you went to a farmer's market, the content in sulforaphane was all over the map. And so there was no, you know, con um, concentration, right, that you, you were guaranteed on that. So and, I, I and still think... I, I just want to stop you right there. I think that's a really important point. Um, uh, uh, it, you know, of course, we want to eat as many of these natural foods, these cruciferous vegetables and these other health promoting fruits, vegetables, etc. And um, those are all super beneficial. However, if you want to know that you're getting a concentrated therapeutic dosage of some of these nutrients, the only way you can know for sure is to add some nutritional supplements to your overall health regimen. Does that mean you can have a terrible diet and just take a few supplements? No. But on the other hand, if you think you're getting a specific amount, because say you look in some book and it says that a carrot on the average has, you know, so many milligrams of uh, beta carotene, that's an average. And if you looked at, you know, 20 different carrots, some have way less, some have way more. So if you really want to be accurate and scientific and make sure you're getting uh, a minimal necessary amount to have a therapeutic effect, uh, this is one of the reasons why supplementation on top of healthy diet is really the only way to do it. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. And, you know, one of the things I have in my book is this pyramid that shows food at the bottom is food is first and always right. So, um, then herbs is second and then third is supplements uh, because it really is there to supplement our diet. And unfortunately it has become unnecessary these days. So Back to sulforaphane, um, I still want to encourage everybody to eat their broccoli sprouts, add that you know, uh, to your salads, soups, and such. Uh, but if you want a standardized, let's say 7%, 8% of sulforaphane in a supplement, you do have to rely most likely on a supplement. So, so you mentioned calcium deglucurate, sulforaphane, and DIM. So I just want to kind of contextualize it a little bit because one of the things that I think DIM um, manufacturers have done a great job um, in terms of marketing is to develop the perception that DIM is the estrogen buster, right? So it's like take DIM and all your estrogen dominant symptoms go away. And it, and it can uh, initially, and most of the women will feel like it either works initially and then it stops, 
um, works initially and then makes them sicker or just makes them sicker right up front. So, um, and so the question is why? And the interesting thing is, is that your liver has got two parts of the detoxification process, phase one and phase two. What DIM does is upregulates your phase one liver detoxification, which is actually quite dangerous because you are just upregulated that part of the liver that's actually just released a lot of the uh, toxins. And the part two, the phase two of detoxification is gonna be now coupling them up, marrying them with different compounds, whether it's sulfur, whether it's methyl groups, et cetera. So um, DIM upregulates that. If you don't have something to support your phase two liver detoxification in the form of food and supplements, that that's the reason why women start feeling so bad and their symptoms actually um, get worse with estrogen dominance. So the way to, to provide a full estrogen detoxification protocol, this is where you can um, start looking into sulforaphane and calcium deglucurate. Sulforaphane, um, both of them work on phase two liver detoxification. Um, some practitioners I also you know, know who like to also work with things like NAC, resveteral, um, all play a very big role in a phase two liver detoxification. So I think you can play, out, play around with all these supplements. I personally love using, so I've had the best results with sulforaphane and calcium deglucurate. Um, just because they work on different pathways, sulforaphane tends to work a little bit more on the sulfation pathway. That's one of the pathways that um, uses, is used to um, neutralize estrogen and, um, and get rid of it. And then the second one is a glucoordination pathway where calcium deglucurate plays a role. Cool. Yeah. Um, we were talking about uh, progesterone. Um, do you ever use um, chaseberry or Vitex to stimulate progesterone production? Um, so I love your questions, I will say. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's so, it's so great you asking that question because in Germany, uh, where, by the way, herbal medicine is covered by insurance, right? And it's always homeopathy, which is like, I hope the United States comes to that point one day. Uh, uh, let's hope not, but because um, <laughs> that means you'll get three cents uh, reimbursed right. and... Uh, Right. And well, then, I was talking more know, from a patient's, from a patient's yeah, perspective, let's, let's but just I hear you. Yeah. And homeopathy like they have in Australia. And right. So the thing, the interesting thing is when you have a woman who walks into, um, say, OBGYN in Germany and says, I can't get pregnant, right? Or my periods are super irregular, or I'm having lumpy breasts or whatever, and it's a clear progesterone deficiency. The first thing that a German doctor will prescribe is guess what? Vitax. Um, so absolutely, Vitex is phenomenal at um, just helping boost the progesterone. And so that's definitely one of my absolute favorite uh, herbs. And, you know, coupling that up um, with a couple of um, vitamins and minerals. So zinc, vitamin E, and vitamin C can be just also just give a real beautiful boost to the uh, corpus luteum to produce its own native progesterone. Uh, so I, I like combining them together and I, I find that this just works really well. Just a little um, thing just to share with you because of COVID, I have my vitamin C levels. And so, you know, I'm 48, so I'm, I'm certainly had it for perimenopause, my luteal phase. So from ovulation to period now it's suddenly become like five days instead of being two weeks. Right. So classical symptoms, I'm like slowly getting into it. Like nothing, you know, nothing dramatic, nothing crazy. Um, it's just there, it's coming. And so when I upped my vitamin C levels because of COVID, guess what? My luteal phase just suddenly became two weeks again. I'm like, oh, do I really want this? You know? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> go away. Um, oh, I wanted to go back to the seed thing because you mentioned um, I, you mentioned uh, flax seeds and pumpkin seeds as both helping with estrogen and was it what, what sesame seeds and um, sunflower and sunflower seeds is helping with progesterone? Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, seed rotation is something that I um, I discovered many years ago. I had a very uh, difficult patient. Was back in the day when I was in private practice. I had a very difficult patient, and she her hormones were all over the place, like super estrogenic. And um, and I remember um, doing a consult with uh, with a lab uh, where we got the results from. And there was a naturopath who was consulting me on this case. And she said, have you tried seed rotation? And I was like, no. So she explained that, which I'll tell you in a second. Um, and the thing was, and I'm thinking to myself, how, like this woman was like, her hormones were all over the place. And I'm thinking, how are these little seeds gonna help this poor woman, 
right? And she, and you know, but she was she was game. She was down. She she didn't want to take supplements. That that was one one of those challenges. Um, but she was willing to do the C rotation, and so. And so the results were amazing. Um, and one of the things that really changed for her was that her fibroids shrank. And so this woman had less huge fibroids, very heavy periods, uh, severe anemia because of all of that. And so her fibroids shrank significantly within two months. So that was, that was like my aha moment to see rotation. So stage rotation can be used for both uh, women who are still cycling as well as women who are perimenopausal and menopausal. And if you were cycling, you basically studying um, the first part, which is you want to boost your estrogen levels, as, um, as you said, and you can do that by using flaxseed and pumpkin seeds. You do that for two weeks, and it's basically one tablespoon of each, uh, freshly ground. And then you switch over around your ovulation. So if your cycle is, let's say, 28 days, then up to 14 days, you switch over to the second combo, which is now going to be uh, helping more with, so it's vitamin A and vitamin E rich, and so you're switching to, um, to sesame seeds and uh, um, sunflower seeds. And, um, and then again, you're doing one tablespoon ground each until you get your period. Um, and you know, it's, it's, look, it's not a magic bullet. <clears throat> Some women try it and, and swear by it, including women who have hot flashes. Um, so if you're in menopausal, your period has stopped, you basically, you can pick two weeks anytime you want. You can do it with, with the moon. So cycling, uh, you know, doing the seed rotation with the moon, uh, meaning when it's full moon, you basically, you know, it's like as if you were having ovulation. So that's when you start your progesterone boosting seeds, your sesame and sunflower seeds um, and do that for two weeks. And, you know, some women report amazing results, but I feel like with everything else, you know, is, uh, you know, is, is homeopathy an answer to everything? No. Is nutrition alone answer to everything? No. Is, uh, chiropractic care, like getting adjusted, you know, answer to every single pain in your body? No. And so, you know, I feel like it's just one tool in the toolbox that we have. Um, uh, but I think if, if, you know, if, look, let's be honest, if somebody is like super inf inflamed, right, you're still eating gluten, right? You, you know, you, you're living on coffee a whole day. Um, you don't sleep properly, right? You're having three glasses of wine at night, but you do seed rotation and you expect to have great results. When I'm so sorry to say, <laughs> ain't gonna work, right? Um, yeah, so, you're... like, combine it with like an anti-inflammatory diet. Make it a point to go back to sleep. You know, do all the things that helps you sleep better, right? Um, et cetera, et cetera. It, you know, incorporating magnesium. I'm a big, I'm a fanatic for magnesium. You know, and women's hormones, right? Like, what a change it can make in your breast health, your PMSs, your just your overall your sleep quality. Um, and then adding seed rotation, I think, can generate some really nice results. Right. You mentioned alcohol and uh, I, I saw in your book, you're pretty outspoken that um, the evening glass of wine is not a good thing for women for breast cancer risk. Absolutely. I mean, there is, you know, heart solid studies that show connection between women who drink more than three glasses of alcohol um, a week and, and the connection to breast cancer. But I think there is more to that. I mean, do we have to drastic, look at drastic things like breast cancer, right? Just look at the quality of your life. And one thing I will say is that, you know, I, I, I do, talk, I have a big chapter on sleep as well. And, you know, one of the things I do wear, and um, I, I took it off right now because it's charging, but I, I use the aura ring. And with the aura ring, you know, I've been experimenting a lot of my own sleep because my, my sleep has been, you know, now I'm 48, I certainly feel like my sleep is not as deep and is not, I don't get it as easily as I did, you know, in my twenties, right. You can have like five tequilas at night, go and potty, <laughs> look at a screen all day long and go to sleep and, you know, and, and wake up and you're like rested and ready to conquer the world. Ain't going to happen now. Right. And so when I use my aura ring and it just shows me, and I've been experimenting a lot, you know, and, and so I would encourage everyone to, everybody's a little, has got a little different tolerance for, since we're talking about alcohol, um, you know, let me say if I'm, if I have, um, and that's probably also, I think I, I also have a problem with uh, histamine a little bit. So I don't degrade histamine as quickly as probably also partly is genetic, partly is probably just, you know, um, stress and things like that. But, um, alcohol is a huge histamine, um, you know, is, is a source of histamine as well, which can make mess up your sleep. So, you know, that glass of alcohol could just mean that from sleeping deeply and beautifully and not waking up in the middle of the night. Now you were just waking up at one and you can't sleep until three and then you wake up and you're not rested. Uh, I mean, it can make a huge difference in that way. So for that reason, I, um, I am very, 
uh, cautious of alcohol. Same as with caffeine too. I'm a bit of a caffeine Nazi too. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> coffee rather, not caffeine overall, but coffee. Okay. Um, so uh, let's talk about um, hormones, all right? Hormone replacement therapy. Yeah, you know, it's that's I, I will say that's not really my primary jam um, because you know, as a herbalist and a, as a nutrition person, I uh, and a chef, I'm just like, hey, here's a great recipes and here are some beautiful herbs you can incorporate. Um, so I'm not, you know, but uh, the the way I, I look at it is like if you if you decide to go the hormone path, um, make sure it's bioidentical hormones that you're you're working with. You don't want to you working with your OBGYN and taking progestins in any way or form, um, you know, and, and I'm interesting to hear your perspective on this. Um, but it's, um, because again, I'm not in private practice anymore and, and, um, and I don't prescribe, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not licensed to prescribe hormones to women. Um, but one of the things that I think is a little, something that's something to be cautious of is that a lot of women are told that bioidentical estrogen, for example, is super safe. Um, and I have come across a few women, um, who, uh, really bought into this belief, but they never did any regular testing, like with Dutch, for example, to see how they get breaking down those estrogens and a number of them have developed breast cancer. And so, you know, have they developed breast cancer because they were taking that bioidentical estrogen? I don't think so. I think the problem was that their, their liver just wasn't breaking it down properly. They were not eliminating these estrogens, um, properly, but I'm curious to know, what do you think? Um, well, I, you know, obviously there's lots of controversies and as a chiropractor, we don't prescribe hormones either. Okay. Um, uh, but it does look like bioidentical hormones are quite a bit safer. Um, and, uh, theoretically there is every reason to think they should be safe because if they're basically, uh, virtually identical, identical to your natural hormones, why should your natural hormones cause cancer or heart disease. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, the, the, the long-term studies that were done to show that um, um, synthetic hormones um, uh, look like they increase the risk of breast cancer and heart disease in women who take them, especially starting 10 years after menopause. So that's another right. whole factor with the Women's Health Initiative. Um, are problematic. We don't really have the large long-term studies with bioidentical, but we have every reason to think that they are um, safer. But I, I would still say, I don't know if we really 100% know. On the other hand, there are plenty of women who get breast cancer who never took hormones. And so um, your point about how they metabolize their estrogen, how their body handles it, uh, toxic estrogens from the environment, are you know probably more important factors yeah i will and, say and, if and i it, come to a point in my yeah. you know my own health journey that i feel like estrogen my estrogen is dropping so much so that through nutrition i can't support anymore my cognitive function is declining my bones are not as strong etc etc and i decide to go that path i will certainly every six months be, be doing dutch to see how i'm breaking down those estrogens um you know because i think that's really really important as, as part of the equation for sure yeah, yeah. Um, one of my friends um, is Dr. Felice Gersh, and she's she's come on the podcast a number of times, and she is such a huge advocate for estrogen. And when she talks about all the benefits for cardiovascular and brain health and all these other things, I you know I was ready to start taking some estradiol myself. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, I, wanted, I wanted to <laughs> one last thing. I just wanted to ask you about. Uh, using topical progesterone versus oral progesterone, bioidentical, of course. And yeah. most of the functional medicine practitioners who prescribe hormones in my circle um, uh, feel that oral is the only way to go, that when you use the topical, you just don't get the levels in the system that you really need. Yeah. So that's an interesting um, debate. And again, I speak purely through the experience of my colleagues and through conferences and doctrine conferences, functional and doctrine conferences that, you know, we always, we used to go to before Rona uh, took over the world. Um, and so the, the, another way of looking at this is that the um, oral progesterone tends to work on the GABA receptors in the brain. So it's got a really nice calming effect and helps tremendously with sleep and anxiety. 
um, a lot of my colleagues maintain that if you don't apply it topically, you don't get the same benefits of, of what progesterone can give you beyond just feeling calm and sleep. And those benefit benefits can do, it can go, can go anywhere from opposing estrogen to helping you with HDL cholesterol, helping with cardiovascular health, help, helping with sex drive. Um, it's a long, much longer list of, of these two. Again, I really wish I could show you studies um, that prove that. Um, I don't think there are any of those, but what it's, it's just more of um, you know, anecdotal, but I don't want to dismiss anecdotal because if you have, you know, you have thousands of doctors who are in practice with hundreds of patients who come back and report that this is your oral versus this is a topical effect that I'm getting, um, then that's something to be, I think, reckoned with. So I personally, whenever I travel and I'm going through a stressful time, progesterone tends to, we burn through progesterone a lot more. We get depleted um, because cortisol steals progesterone. So when you're, you know, when you're, I mean, a lot of women can relate to this when I say, you know, when you go through a really stressful time, <clears throat> suddenly your period becomes really terrible or you just can't sleep. Um, and progesterone can be uh, due to that, uh, due to, to, to the, the progesterone steal, if you will, that happens. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, so whenever I do experience that, I definitely do um, my topical and I do feel a way, way better. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. So this has been a great podcast, Magdalena. How can our viewers uh, find out more information about you and access your programs and your book? So my book is called Overcoming Estrogen Dominance. It's available on Amazon right now. And um, yeah, if, you know, if estrogen is something that um, folks are struggling with, or if somebody you know who's struggling with the symptoms that we talked about here, there's really, there's so many things you can do nutritionally through supplements. Um, a lot of women are opposed to bioidentical hormones. So I just touch on them in the book, but really the meat of the book is, is herb supplements and, and nutrition. Yeah. Great. And and then your website is what? My website is hormones balance, hormones with an S, hormonesbalance.com. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.